ومن استنى بسنة إلى يوم الدين I praise you to Allah and our peace and blessings and the last prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day In this session I hope to look at another aspect of Tawheed and specifically it is in relationship to Tawheed and Ibadah <coughs> In the previous session uh, in the first session we looked at the various categories of Tawheed three categories which we refer to as Tawheed al-Rububiyya or the unity of Lordship Tawheed al Asma wa Sifat the unity of Allah's names and attributes and Tawheed al-Ibadah or the unity of the worship of Allah and in the second session last week we looked at certain aspects of Tawheed and Asma wa Sifat specifically concerning Allah's attributes which is referred to as an ulu or his transcendency being above his creation and not part of his creation we also looked at an aspect uh, which relates to Tawheed al in the case of uh, people uh, using astrology or astronomy or, or uh, fortune telling etc to give information about the future and we showed how this destroys Tawheed and how a Muslim cannot be involved in such practices in any way with the exception of course of astronomy which you know deals specifically with the scientific aspects of the uh, position of the stars as it relates to man's needs on the earth in relationship to determining the months or the uh, directions for travel on the sea as well as on land in this session we'll be looking at uh, an aspect of Tawheed al-Ibadah which you know, relates to uh, man's relationship to other human beings where communication with God is concerned <coughs> one of the ways by which Satan and the satanic forces have succeeded in causing people who fundamentally believe in God and are seeking to worship God how they have managed to get these people astray is by having them worship other than God while believing that they are worshiping God we mentioned this from in the first session and reiterated it in the second session and in this session we will be looking at that in more detail we gave examples among the Christians for example who worship God but through Jesus and they believe that in worshiping God through Jesus they are in fact worshiping God similarly the Hindus <coughs> in worshiping statues believe that they are worshiping God Brahma who is present within their statues now what has happened amongst Muslims is that they have been divorced from the direct worship of God through the introduction of intermediaries that is people who will take the prayers of one to God people pray to other people with the intention that they will take those prayers to God and we talked about this briefly in the first session because it also relates to Tawheed al Asma wa Sifat in that the argument used by these people is that we need intermediaries in this life to get things done we go to someone who has influence what they call in Arabic wasita you know and this person will intervene on your behalf talk to the higher official so that you can get your affairs taken care of and they say that this is the same thing that we need to do in relationship to God because of the fact that we are 
simple. And as such, our prayers will not be heard. So it is better for us to go to one who is pure of sin, you know, like a prophet or a saint, or somebody of this nature, and this person will carry our prayers to God for us. This is the argument, the rationale which is used. But we pointed out that this rationale, in fact, is, is paganistic. It is shirk because it reduces God to the level of man. It is saying the same way that we have to use intermediaries in our human affairs, God is like a human in the sense that he needs intermediaries. When in fact, Allah has specifically stated in the Quran that we should call on him. Call on me and I will answer you. He didn't say call on those who are close to me. No, he said call on me and I will answer you. And in the past, how we are taught to pray, Only you do we worship, and from only you do we seek help. This is to emphasize in our minds that we should not use any intermediaries anyway. What happens is that people, in spite of this very obvious information which is available in Islam, anybody who reads the Quran can see it and know it, people have been blinded to this reality from two ways, or maybe more than two ways, but I can think of two ways right now. One, in that most people don't read the Quran. What they do is they parrot the Arabic letters and sounds. See, they may learn how to say the letters and the sounds, but they don't know what it says. So they parrot the Arabic, believing that they are reading the Quran. This is what has happened to a huge sector of the Ummah, the Muslim Ummah. They do not know what Allah is saying in the Quran. And this is why Christian missionary work has been successful among the masses of Muslims in areas where they've been given a free hand, like in Bangladesh and in Indonesia. They've been very successful in these countries. Now, this means that there has to be a move amongst Muslims to return to the Qur'an, to the reading and understanding of the Qur'an. That means, since the majority of Muslims do not know Arabic, one, they should be programmed to learn Arabic, not just to parrot it, words and sounds, but to learn and understand the meaning of the Arabic words. That is, it is necessary within the educational programs that among the Muslim communities that are being set up in our times that Arabic should be introduced so it becomes the second language of every Muslim, if not the first. This is a necessary step which has to be taken. Similarly, until that process becomes complete where the vast majority of Muslims do know Arabic, it is necessary for us to rely on translation. So, for languages where people do not have the translations of the, of the Arabic Quran in their languages, then these translations need to be done. And for those who are speaking English or languages where there are translations, it is necessary for them <coughs> to read the Quran in translation. They may read the Arabic to help to develop uh, their consciousness of the Arabic with the intention of learning the Arabic grammar so that they will eventually understand the Quran as it was revealed. But for understanding they will read the translation of the Quran and 
understand what Allah commands what Allah is teaching them if we can get the masses back to the regular reading of the Quran in their languages then a lot of the problems which face the Ummah in the sense of their ignorance of their relationship to God and their obligations will be solved. The other problem area is that we observe that some people seem to be more righteous than others. And because somebody seems to be more righteous, then people tend to depend on that person. This is a part of human nature. And actually Islam encourages us to be among those who are righteous. Prophet Sallam had said that we will be raised up with those who were our friends. The one who is your friend in this life, you'll be raised up, resurrected, along with him. So if you keep corrupt friends, then that's who you will be raised up with. So Prophet said, be careful about who you take as your friend. On another occasion, he said that we should choose a righteous companion. Because the righteous companion is like the perfume merchant. When you sit with him, either when you get up to leave, you will go away smelling good because he's opened all these different bottles and the aroma, sweet smells from the perfume has come over it, so you will leave smelling sweet. Or he will give you a bottle, a small bottle or something like this as a gift. Whereas the bad companion is like the blacksmith, the one who works the bellows, blowing the air on the hot metal and beats it with the uh, other piece of iron, you know, to shape it or whatever. While he's beating it, sparks are flying all the time. So if you're in this company, either some sparks are going to go on your clothes and burn holes in your clothes or you're going to go away stinking of smoke you know if you sit around those people who smoke cigarettes when you come away from them it smells like you smoke cigarettes it's the same idea so the good companion is going to help you in one way or another whereas the evil companion is going to harm you in one way or another so it is important for you to choose as your close companions those who remind you of Allah not those who when you sit down with them they're, all they're talking about is this life the things of this life they want to get a car they want to do this and they want to do that and you know and then of course people spend most of the time talking about these things they'll end up talking about corruption because you know they, you never have enough of these things so it means that you have to be making plans to get some more of these things you know, which are uh, through illegal means. So they'll be talking to you about trying to do this, to steal that, or to, you know, to cheat this one. And, and you sitting there, even though you may not be intending to do these things, you hearing this all the time, eventually going into your brain, because you can't close your ears. So it is going into your head all the time. And it sits in your brain, it becomes subconscious thought. So you might find yourself under other circumstances, starting to think in that direction. So this is how you may be affected. So it is very important that you choose people as your close friends, those who are talking about salah, righteousness, you know, da'wah, improving life, you know, things which are positive. It doesn't mean that they can't talk about things of this world also, because this is part of our life. But it's just that that doesn't make up the totality of what they're talking about. And they're not talking about the illegal ways to get these things. So if you sit among people who are talking like this, you should advise them that it is wrong, and if they do not stop talking in this fashion, you should leave them. Because 
your ears will be witness for you or against you on the day of judgment. And if you sit there whilst they continue to talk this stuff, then you are also partly in sin. So, we are obliged by Islam to choose righteous companions. So now, we understand that. There is a tendency for people to hold those who appear to be more righteous, you know, in special places of honor. And when these people die, Satan will come to the people and encourage them to start doing certain practices which are away from the basic teachings of Islam which are connected to these people. The Prophet explained this to us very carefully concerning certain people who were in the time of Prophet Nuh when these righteous people died, Satan came to their followers and suggested to them to make statues and paintings of these righteous people and to put them in the places where they used to sit, the places, their homes, by the graves, different places where they used to be so that people, when they would come to these places, would be reminded of these righteous people and that would in turn encourage them to do good. The people did this and it did encourage them to do good. They didn't worship these people. However, when this generation died off, time passed, Satan now came again to the next generations of people and told them that in fact that earlier generation was worshipping these statues and uh, paintings. And it was through their worship that the rain came and you know good came to the society, etc. And so that generation started to worship. And Prophet explained that this is how Shirk first entered amongst the that is how shirk first entered among the Ummah. So this is a lesson to us. There's a lesson in it. One, it shows us why Islam is so opposed to imagery, paintings, statues of living beings, whether human or animal, fish, bird. Because when people choose objects of worship, they most often choose those that are living, either in the form of a human being. You look at the Hindus, you see their images. Either they are images of human beings, or they're animals. They got one with an elephant head, you know, they got a monkey god, and they got a variety. They're always either human beings or animals. This is the most common. You do find people also who will worship just plain old stones. But usually they'll take the stone and carve some kind of image in there. They don't usually leave just a stone by itself and it becomes an object of worship. Not usually. Unless, you know, they just they have no implements, no means of carving this thing. So, this is the most common form of worship. And because of this tendency amongst men, then the, the, the issue of of making statues and paintings, drawings, etc., of humans and animals is totally prohibited in Islam. At the same time, we are also prohibited from seeking any kind of help from those who died. The Prophet has said, when a man dies, he is cut off 
from this world except in the case of three things some good deed that he has done in the form of knowledge which people benefit from or some charity he has made which whose benefit continues you know he built a masjid or orphanage or something like this or he has a righteous son child who prays for him this way he can take benefit but in terms of him benefiting those who are living no he enters into the state known as the Barza and he can no longer have any contact with the living so such a person no matter how righteous they are can do nothing for us the Prophet <coughs> explained that Allah has favored some of us over others in a variety of different ways but we should look to those below us because it better reminds us of Allah's mercy on us Allah has said in the Quran that he has favored some men over others in wealth he has favored some prophets over others though we look at the prophets as one brotherhood Allah says تِلْكَ غُسُلُ فَضَّلْنَا بَعْضُهُمْ عَلَى بَعْضُ those were the prophets some of whom we favored over others some Allah spoke to directly in the case of Prophet Musa he spoke to continually the majority of revelation she received was direct word of God without the agency of the angel Jibreel others he gave certain miracles like in the case of prophet Jesus and like this but in terms of closeness to God and this is something which the individual earns it is not merely a favor because the favor which Allah gives in the case of wealth intelligence strength these which Allah gives we have no right to be proud of because it's really not a result of our own efforts this is what Allah gives and this is why Allah says that the best among us to Allah is the one who fears Allah the most you see this is a result of individual striving this is what makes a man superior to another man this is real superiority one who fears Allah the most inna akramakum inda Allahi ashaqukum the most noble of you to Allah is the one who fears Allah the most now this quality or this nobility is known only to Allah this is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on his khutbat al-wada' and the farewell pilgrimage you know he had said at taqwa ha huna taqwa the fear of Allah is here pointing to his heart nobody knows none of us can judge who has taqwa and who does not ultimately we have been given certain signs by which we may judge on the outside if a person is not going to the masjid he doesn't fast we can conclude that the man has no taqwa no fear of God or whatever he has is so small it's not motivating him to do anything the one who is always in the masjid always fasting we can conclude that this man has taqwa fear of God but now how much taqwa he has 
And you have some people who like to prey on this idea of your iman becoming complete. You see? Who can judge whose iman is complete? When we have no means really of judging the level of somebody's taqwa. This is why after the battle of Qunayn, when the Prophet ﷺ was walking with some of the companions past people who had died during the battle. And they were saying, so and so calling out the name, so and so is a shaheed, a martyr. So this person is a martyr. That one is a martyr. The Prophet said nothing as they were saying these things. So finally they said, they said they referred to one person, said a martyr, the Prophet said, and he said, no. I saw him in the hellfire wearing a cloak from the spoils that he stole. You see, they, the companions, were judging from the fact that this man fought and died in the path of Allah. That he was a martyr on having the highest levels of taqwa who was guaranteed paradise. But the Prophet said, no, he will be in the hellfire wearing a cloak from the spoils that he stole. In other words, he was there fighting not to raise Allah's word above all, because this is the true jihad, when one fights to keep Allah's word uppermost. He was fighting for the spoils, what he could get out of it. So his intention destroyed any value that he would have gotten from dying in the path of Allah. So, this is all pointing to us, pointing out for us that there is no means of determining truly who are close to Allah and who are not. Now, Allah has said in the Quran about his close friends, awliya, and awliya is a term which Muslims have taken to be equivalent to saints. Amongst the Christians and the others, they have a hierarchy of individuals whom they call saints. People who they feel are on the highest levels of taqwa and being closest to God. So Christians, especially the Catholics, will direct their prayers to these individuals. And Muslims, not to be outdone, you know, because they're always in competition with their the Christians, so they feel, you know, like since they have a uh, Christmas, you know, big celebration for the birth of Jesus, well, are we better than the Christians? Let's have a big celebration for the birth of Muhammad. They call Mawlid or Mawlud, you know. The Christians have these beads, they call them rosaries, that they use to count out their own, you know. So Muslims, they don't want to let anybody get ahead of them, so we have to have some beads, we call them zikr beads. So, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that this would happen. He said that you will follow the ways of the people before you, inch by inch, foot by foot, so much so that if they enter a lizard's hole, you know, the hole that the lizard digs in the ground where he is, you will go in after them. And they asked, are you referring to the Christians and the Jews? He said, who else? This is a warning, one of the signs. The Muslims would imitate them. And surely, we have. So in this issue of the saints, you know, Muslims have felt, well, we have to have certain saints also. You know, the Christians have these saints, I mean, we are pious people who must be closer to Allah than these people ever were. So, they have set up a, a hierarchy of so-called saints, and they've given them the Islamic terminology of awliya. Now, Allah has said who his awliya are. He has explained to us very clearly in the Quran who they are. And the term wali actually means a person who is a close friend. 
And it has a number of other meanings too. Could be a close well relative. It's used in this term in the Quran also. But the one which you know is most uh, relevant to us is the verse in which Allah says, Inna or in awliya'uhu illa al-muttaqoon walakinna aktharuhum la ya'lamoon Verily his, that is Allah's, awliya are those with taqwa but most people do not realize that. You know, if you ask a person, you know, who believes in such and such a saint why is it that you believe that this person is a saint? He'll say, <clears throat> because he did this miracle, you know, when he died and the people went to his grave, the water that they had turned to milk and they drank milk. You know, or, you know, they have, you know, this woman went, they couldn't have babies and they went and prayed at his grave and, you know, they got pregnant. You know, all these kind of, all these miracles. This is how people determine who is the only one who is. But Allah says, His awliya are those who have taqwa. But most people don't realize it. That's the ignorance. They don't realize that the true criteria for what they call wilaya or closeness to God is that of taqwa. And Allah says, أَلَا إِنَّ أَوْلِيَاءَ اللَّهِ لَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَكَانُوا يَتَّقُونَ Behold, certainly no fear nor grief shall overcome the awliya of Allah, those who believe and have taqwa. Allah explains who the awliya are, those who believe and have taqwa. And elsewhere in Surah Al Baqarah, Allah has said that He is the wali of those who believe. So, this tells us, so I said it's very important for us to read the Quran. Because if people read the Qur'an, then they'll know who the awliya are. But if they don't read the Qur'an, then they will just follow the traditions of their parents, their grandparents, their great-grandparents, which is, you know, worshipping these saints, so-called saints. Any believer can be a one. All true believers are awliya. That is the reality. Those who truly believe in Allah, living by that belief, they become the friends of Allah. This is the reality. But as Allah says, most people don't realize that. Now, People like to insist that, in fact, we are not worshipping these awliya. We are only asking them to ask Allah for us. This is not worship. Now don't mix this up. We are not praying to these people. Because sure, you have some people who will pray to them directly. Right? This is obvious shirk. You know, something bad happens, they call us, Ya Mushiddin! O Mushiddin, help us! This is clear shirk. Nobody can argue that this is not shirk. But then you have others who are saying, No, we're, we're not doing this. We understand. This is shirk. You know, we are just asking these people to ask Allah for us. Now, the Prophet ﷺ has said, الدُّعَاءُ وَالْعِبَادَةُ Calling on anyone in worship is worship. He has clarified that. If you call on anyone, 
person who is dead, you call on them to do anything for you, to speak to Allah or whatever, this is worship. So, that cannot be used to justify calling on others besides Allah. Now, there is a philosophy which is the basis of what is known as mysticism or Sufism, you know, which is widespread amongst the Muslim Ummah. This Sufism promotes the idea that it is possible to become one with Allah. Ultimately, this is what it teaches. This is the vast majority of the branches of Sufism. Now, you see, Sufism in a sense is like Christianity. In that, if you say Christians believe that God has three parts, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You run into problems because you find some Christians, like the Jehovah's Witness, they will say, No, we don't believe that. We don't believe that. We don't believe, we don't believe in any Holy Ghost. There is God the Father, and there is the created Son. This is Jehovah's Witness. And you will find other branches who will hold, for example, the uh, Eastern Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox, they hold that the Father is greater than the Son. They're not equal. So you have a variety of different, you know, versions of this belief. So, though you may take out one principle which seems to be the common principle, you have always some exceptions. Similarly with Sufism. There is a general belief that the majority hold, but then you'll have some exceptions who don't necessarily hold or practice. So what I'm talking about is the general teaching. This general teaching is based on the concept that each and every one of us has within him a portion of God. Our soul, they believe, is divine. They say, to support this idea, if you go to the Quran, you will find verses in the Quran wherein Allah says, in reference to Prophet Adam, then he, Allah, fashioned Adam and blew in him from his spirit. You see, there it is. Allah, when he created Adam, blew a portion of his spirit into Adam. And this spirit, you know, as Adam's descendants came, they carried each and every one within him a portion of this spirit inherited from Adam, which is divine. And the goal of every human being, the real true goal, is to make that portion which is divine within him reunite with the divine spirit. Sounds beautiful. But when you read Hinduism, you find this is the same teaching. The Hindus believe that the human soul is a part of the universal soul, Brahma, which was released when the person, you know, ends his cycles of rebirths, when he reaches the state of nirvana, he no longer is reborn, then that divine soul, which is inside of himself, reunites with the universal soul. This is their belief. Some people will argue, well, just because it's a Hindu belief, it doesn't mean that it's wrong for us to believe this. No. This is 
evidence that this was the true teaching. Because there it is amongst Hinduism, you know, it is from the teachings of the prophets that went to the Hindus. And this confirms the truth of our teachings. But, in fact, this is not true. Because the spirit itself is something which Allah created. Allah is not a spirit, nor does He have a spirit. When the Prophet ﷺ was questioned about the spirit by the Jews, and he asked Allah, Allah told him to say to them, the Ruh, the Spirit, is from my Lord's command. It is by my Lord's command. Allah says, if Allah wishes a thing to be, He only orders Kun Fayakun. His command is be and it is. The Spirit is created. Allah is not a spirit, nor does He have a spirit. In fact, you find when you read through the Qur'an, and as I said, you have to read throughout the whole Qur'an to get the correct picture of the Islamic concepts. Because if you take a verse out of context, then, as that is out of context of the rest of the Qur'an, you can get other meanings. Allah refers throughout the Qur'an to a number of things as being His. But, do we believe anywhere that Allah says this is His, that this literally means that it is His? For example, when Allah says, this is in reference <coughs> to Prophet Saleh sent to the Thamud and the camel which was sent to him. هَذِهِ نَاقَةُ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ عَيَةً فَذَرُوهَا تَأْكُلْ فِي أَرْضِ اللَّهِ This is Allah's camel sent to you as a sign. So allow it to graze in Allah's earth. We have in this verse, نَاقَةُ اللَّهُ Allah's camel and Ardullah, Allah's earth. Do we believe that Allah has a camel? No. When Allah refers to the masjids on the earth as being Buyutullah, the houses of Allah, do we believe that Allah has a house? He lives in a house? No. So Allah will refer to certain aspects of His creation as being His. But it doesn't mean in the literal sense His in the sense that it is actually a part of Him. There are certain times when He refers to something as being His which, which refers to a part of Him. In the sense when Allah refers for example to His mercy. It is His. His mercy. But it's just like yourself. When you talk about my hand and my shirt, these two things have two different meanings. Although in the both cases you're saying mine. My hand and my shirt. My hand is something which is a part of you. My shirt is something which you acquired, which you put on, you can take off. It's not a part of you. So when we find that Allah refers to certain things in the Qur'an as being His. We have to put it in one of these categories. Either it something which actually is His, meaning a part of Him, something from Him directly, or something which is from His creation. And we find that Allah would refer to things that His creation as being His as a means of honoring it. Because all houses on the earth are Allah's in the sense that He is the one who gave man the means and the materials to make these houses. The means, the materials, and the intelligence. There is. 
always. But the houses in which he is worshipped, Allah refers to these as his, because they are more honored. He has raised them in honor over the rest of the houses by calling them his, because he is worshipped in these houses. Similarly, all camels are Allah's. But the camel which was sent as a miracle to Prophet Salih uh, is one which the Prophet ﷺ explained. In the hadith which is found in the 40 hadiths, the Prophet ﷺ explained that verily your creation is combined in your mother's womb for 40 days in the form of an oily fluid, then as a leech-like clot for a similar period, and as a clump of flesh for another similar period. Then an angel is sent to him to blow the spirit into him. This is the process by which the spirit enters the body. An angel blows the spirit actually into the body. But some person says, but Allah says there that he blew the spirit into Adam. And he blew the spirit into Mary. Well, again, if we look through the Qur'an, we find that Allah says, We created you and whatever you do. Wallahu khalaqakum wa ma ta'amaloon. Allah created you and whatever you do. Wa ma ramayta idh ramayt, wa lakinna Allah rama. It was not you that threw, but it was Allah who threw. This is in reference to the battle of Badr, before which, when the enemy was lined up on the horizon, the Prophet Muhammad picked up a handful of dirt and threw it in their direction. The enemy, after the battle, later on some of them accepted Islam, they mentioned that, you know, before the battle of Badr, all of a sudden we found dust in our eyes. I mean, there was no dust storm. It was strange, you know, where did it come from? Allah had caused the dust which the Prophet ﷺ threw to reach the eyes of the enemy that was hundreds of yards away. This was a miracle. So Allah said, it wasn't you that threw, but Allah who threw. So Allah calls it His throwing. Yet it was in fact the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ who threw. So Allah will refer to certain things as being His, His doing, because of the special status that it holds. This entrance of the Spirit into Adam is special, because Adam was without father and mother. He was the first man. The entrance of the Spirit into Isa was special, because this was a sign, a miracle. He was born without a father. So Allah refers to the, in both of these occasions as Him blowing the Spirit. And actually if we read on concerning the story of Mary, we see that Allah says, فَأَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهَا وُحَنَا فَتَمَثَّلَ لَهَا بَشَرًا سَوِيًّا So we send to her our spirit who took the appearance of a well-formed man. Allah is referring to Jibreel, the angel, as our spirit, as his spirit. But in fact it was Jibreel. Allah uses the term spirit in reference to Jibreel, our spirit, to honor Jibreel amongst the angels. So, when we look at these facts together, we can only conclude that the Spirit is created by God. The angels put it into Adam and into every human being when he reaches a certain stage of his development in the womb of his mother. 
and it is a human spirit it will come to an end as it had a beginning Allah is without beginning and without end and that spirit cannot unite with Allah because it is finite, it is human Allah is infinite He is God so the true purpose and striving of man is not to become one with God but to worship God as completely as he can this is the true striving and Allah says in the Quran I have not created the jinn or mankind except for my worship that is the central goal of human life human strife to worship Allah not to become one with God of course you have when you look into the hierarchy of saints you have an individual by the name of Hallaj who was famous for the pronouncement An al I am the reality Allah of course in the Quran says wa huwa al haq Allah is al haq we call ourselves Abdul Haq but here is this man saying An al haq I am al haq and when he said this he was tried by the scholars of his time and told to recant to give this up recant from it he refused. He stood up and he opened up his soul, his uh, cloak, and said, There is nothing inside this cloak except Allah. He was following this delusion that man could become one with God. And it should be noted also that the origin of this idea exists among Hinduism as it exists among Greek philosophy in the writings of Plato you will find references to this and the term mysticism is defined as an experience of union with God and the belief that man's main goal lies in seeking that union this is held amongst Christians also it's the basis of Christian mysticism and these ideas in fact are foreign to Islam they are concepts of paganism as such the belief that anyone can carry our prayers to God for us who has died because of their elevated status is unacceptable Islamically the people who people have assigned as saints we don't really know really what their state is only Allah knows and the belief that these people because of their status anything which is connected with them also carries a higher status like people you know will say that if you go to the tomb of such and such a person making prayers in the presence there not to the person not to the person in the tomb or even asking the person in the tomb anything just to pray in the presence you see this will make the value of the prayers more because the area of this person is blessed you know truly Prophet ﷺ said that we should not set out in a religious journey except to three places Masjid al-Aqsa where prayer there is worth 500 prayers elsewhere my Masjid where prayer is there is worth a thousand prayers elsewhere and Masjid al-Haram where prayers there are worth 
a hundred thousand prayers elsewhere. This is it. These three places, the value of prayer there is increased based on the statement of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi himself. We do not have the right to say that prayers are increased in anywhere else on earth. All other places are equal. It doesn't matter who is buried there. There is no more value of prayer there. And the belief that people hold that the area of the Kaaba called Hijr Ismail, you know, behind the Kaaba there is a circular, semicircular wall. They say this is Hijr Ismail. They call it this and they say this is where Ismail and others of the prophets were buried. This is nonsense. It is nonsense. This area was a part of the Kaaba. When the people who were building the Kaaba ran out of funds during the time of the Prophet before he reached prophethood, they ran out of funds in building it. They stopped in the cubic shape and they made a small barrier at the back to indicate the remainder of the Kaaba. This is why it's there. This is why you don't make the wall through there. Because if you cut through there, then you're not making tawaf. You're not going around the Kaaba, you're going through the Kaaba. This is why we have to go around. The name of Hujr Ismail is a name given by the ignorant people. And the practice that you find amongst people where when it rains, you'll see people going near the trough which is coming off the roof of the uh, Kaaba and collecting this water in bottles and containers, right? Sending the water back to their country and says, holy water <laughs> came off the roof of the cow. <coughs> this is pure ignorance. Because anybody who sits there for a period of time, he sees the birds flying over, defecating on the top of the cow. It's not happening. The birds are flying over and defecating. I know, when I was in, in, in uh, Canada before I be, came over here, you know, people who had come, uh, Muslims from different parts of the world, you know, I told them, you know, the Kaaba, you know, there's a special like force field which goes up from the Kaaba right up into the heavens, to the Kaaba that is up in heaven. That the birds don't even fly over the Kaaba, they fly around. You know, I accepted it because I had no knowledge, you know. I went, when I first went to make Umrah, I sat for a while and watched and found it was not true. There were birds flying over the Kaaba all the time. Not only flying, but defecating, as I said, on top of the tower. So what these people are collecting here? <laughs> it's a mixture, you know, of water which you could call really nudges. Water which you can't even make wudu with. And they are taking this water and believing somehow that it is, you know, has these healing qualities to it. In Medina, you find people doing the same thing off the roof of the Prophet Muhammad's mansion. And furthermore, when I was there studying, I observed that some people, especially people from Pakistan and India, were coming and buying these little vials, you know, they look like uh, perfume bottles, empty ones, right? Little you know, vials with dust inside of it. You know, I was wondering what is this stuff? So I asked. And they said, well, you know, there are some people who are in charge of cleaning, you know, the, the house of Aisha inside where Prophet son is buried and it's covered by uh, a wall around it. And then there's a green cloth over it, right? So when you go there, you look through the brass bars, all you see is the green cloth. Anyway, at certain times in the year, those people who look after the relics and so on, so the master, they go inside there. They don't want to have the key. And they will dust off the green cloak and collect the dust. And then this is what they put in the vial. And the people will come from India and Pakistan and pay a thousand riyals for a vial of dust. <laughs> you know. Brushed off the cloak, the cloth which covers the house of Aisha. So believing that this is that now if a person dies, you sprinkle a little bit of this dust on the person before you wrap them up. 
This is guaranteed ticket now to paradise. <laughs> this is the ignorance. Wherein people believe that, you know, the Barakah, because Prophet died, buried there, somehow everything which is connected to him in any way now carries this Barakah. Ignorance. I'm told, you know, in India and in Pakistan and also in Turkey, you know, if you have people in different villages and so, they will have uh, a container, a small container, which they bring out, you know, on certain occasions in the year, usually Prophet's birthday and so on. And in it they will have a hair, which they claim is a hair from the head of the Prophet. And some people claim this hair even grows, and they will cut off pieces and you know, give it, and other people will have this hair, and it's supposed to continually growing. And people will come, you know, to touch this thing, you know, just to get the barakah of seeing the hair, you know. And in the museum in Turkey, the uh, Topkapi Museum in Turkey, they have also what they claim to be the suits of Prophet Muhammad. It was knocked out during the Battle of Muhammad. And in uh, Morocco they have the tooth also. And if you go around the Muslim world, you find in various places they have that tooth. But they only lost one tooth. <laughs> but you go around, you find they have enough teeth to make a whole, you know, mouth. <laughs> and people again attributing special qualities to these relics. This is what the Muslim Ummah has, you know, that's become the most important thing. You find articles where a person finds a fish with Allah written on the side. They say, written on the side in the scale of Allah. Or a leaf. Allah. You know, a variety of different things. You had one guy in uh, Turkey, supposed surgeon, whatever. He said that inside of, you know, the heart, inside of a certain ventricle, there is Allah written here. Inside everybody. There was one paper they had circulating around here uh, maybe about a year ago. They had it said inside the trachea, you know, the the, um, the the windpipe, you know, which carries air, the air that you breathe is, is carried into the lungs, right, the trachea. They said, written on there is, La ilaha illa Muhammad or Rasulullah. All nonsense. Nonsense. This is what becomes now the sign of Islam. Muslims have lost so much touch it with Islam, that they are now grabbing on to any little thing which will appear now to be, you know, special, miraculous. But now what happens when a Christian finds a fish with a cross on it? Or another Christian, he, you know, he opens up some organ of the body and shows you how this organ forms a cross in it. Then what? What are we going to say? What do we have to say? You see, this is not Islam. This is not Islam. This is the ignorance of Muslims who have lost touch with Islam. They now put all of their emphasis on things which in fact have nothing to do with Islam at all. Okay, it's uh, time for the Adhan now, right? So, uh, what the, the last time we had given the Adhan and after the Adhan we were supposed to continue with the question and answer, right? So I don't know, uh, everybody refers to Allah and Allah's speech and that's something that is from Muhammad uh, Now inshallah if you have any questions concerning the topic of today's presentation, please feel free to ask. duty on your part to ask until you have understood so please do not feel shy to ask you know, questions on uh, first we'll deal with questions concerning the topic of the presentation if there are no questions then inshallah we can go on to general questions Concerning 
people who are creative. And uh, we find this uh, concept uh, in many countries, especially in Asian countries. And we also find big more near these places. And we also find uh, big lectures we have here. And also find the people going there. How we can stop this? Change the mind to what you are saying. Well, as I suggested, the starting point is getting people back to the Quran. Because you're dealing with something which has become a norm in the society. So much so that anyone who speaks out against it or stands up against it is looked at as being a deviant, a person who has gone astray. Usually such people are lab labeled Wahhabis. You know? This is the common title which is put on such people. So it means that such problems one cannot tackle directly unless it is, you know, within a family, you know, your own, your parents or your children or your relatives who may listen to you. So you can tell them directly. You can try to speak to them very directly. However, beyond those people who will listen, you have to try to educate them by bringing them back to the foundations of Islam. I spoke about the Quran. This is fundamental. If you can bring people back to the foundations of Islam by having them, for example, you know, read the Quran in translation, or you have a circle where you are just reading the Quran and explaining the Quran. You use this as a means because nobody is going to fight over the Qur'an. You use this as a means to get people to understand what Allah is saying because all that I've spoken today against these ideas, this is all from the Qur'an. So it is all there. But people, as I said, have been cut off from the Qur'an. And then of course what you try to bring them to is the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad you know, and inshallah in our future sessions we'll be looking at the sunnah in detail and so forth. And we can see that this is the other important fundamental that the people have to come back to. Because as the Prophet ﷺ said, تَرَكْتُ فِيكُمْ أَمْرَيْنِ إِنْ تَمَسَكْتُمْ بِهِ مَا لَنْ تُضِلُّ عَبَدًا I've left with you two things. If you hold on to them firmly, you will never go astray. كِتَابُ اللَّهُ وَسُنَّةِ You know, the book of Allah and my sunnah. These two are inseparable. We cannot say we're only going to follow the Quran. No. The Quran, to understand the Quran, we need the Sunnah. You can't separate them. Allah revealed the final message of Islam through the Quran and the Sunnah. We have to recognize that both are sources of revelation. So we have to bring the people back to these sources. When the people can seek knowledge and benefits from these sources, then you can now introduce the ideas and it will be clear to them, it will be obvious because they have respect for the Qur'an that, which comes from reading it. You see, what happens is that people's respect for the Qur'an is in uh, rituals. Before they read the Qur'an, they will kiss it, put it on the head, on the chest and all these different things. If the Qur'an falls on the ground, I mean, it's like a grave sin. I was just with one group where people, you know, one, one uh, people was with me, the Qur'an fell on the ground, so the other person said, oh, you're going to have to give some money in Salah. So I said, well, what was that? He said, well, you know, our teacher, who happened to be Pakistani, had, had told them that if the Qur'an falls on the ground, you should give Salah. I said, you know, these are new Muslims. I said, does that make sense to you? You know, when you are dealing, if somebody says that this happens, you must give sadaqah. It means you have done something wrong. You have done a sin. In Islam, truly, if you do something wrong, you try to do a good deed to wipe out that evil deed. This is a principle in Islam. But now, if the Qur'an accidentally falls on the ground, have you done a sin? 
Is that an evil deed that you have to do a good deed to wind it up? Surely not. Because your intent is not for it to fall on the ground. It's not your intent. You see, if a person throws the Quran on the ground, yes, it's an evil. It's an evil deed. Because his intention in taking the Quran and throwing it on the ground is he's, he's debating the Quran. But if it slips from your hand, is there an evil deed? Of course not. Satur, you have to use your mind. If people come and they tell you that you have to ask, did Prophet Sallallahu say to do this? Did his companions do this? Is there something, you know, because what happens is that the people are so involved in cultural practices, they hardly know what Islam is anymore. So reference for the Qur'an is today kissing, paying sadaqah, you know, covering it and putting it in high places. Even when I was in the Philippines last year, I was in a conference in Manila, and I met uh, one brother, a convert Muslim in, from Taiwan, and he was saying, you know, that Islam is spreading there gradually, but he said there was a family there, a well-known, well-established family of Muslims who, when you see their practices, it's like Buddhism, but they call themselves Muslims. They have the Qur'an in a cloth container hanging from the ceiling, and they go in one room, and they go in there and they burn incense, and they feel that this is worship. Now, he said, he tried to find out, where did it come from? How did it, they explain? He found out. What happened is that a family from the mainland, you know, when Mao Zedong and his gang came and took over uh, China and chased Chiang Kai-shek and his other, the others out and they went to Taiwan, among them were Muslim families. One family, they came, they settled there in, uh, in Taiwan, and the man, you know, with his family, he, he, he was old, and what he used to emphasize to the children is putting the Qur'an in a high place. Now, he didn't know Arabic, couldn't read the Qur'an. His, even his knowledge of Islam was just, you know, just a few rituals that he had, and he would emphasize it. Whatever you do, you must keep the Qur'an in a high place. He died. So now the children, they followed what he told them, to keep the Qur'an in high place. And you know, around them, they're growing up around uh, in a Buddhist, all the others are Buddhist, you know, and their form of worship is this, you know, burning of incense, meditation type worship. So this is the kind of worship that they picked up from going to school and everything else. And all they could remember is just keeping the Qur'an in a high place, so that's what they did. They put the Qur'an inside of this cloth uh, bag, and they hung it from the ceiling. And this is what they do. And the Muslims now, you know, people as Islam is spread, people come into Islam, and try to speak. And they don't know what to accept from them. You don't know. You just became Muslim. You're a convert. But we were born Muslims. We know. This is a big problem. Big problem. That people have been divorced from the Quran. So, this is, I would say, is the most important, you know, thrust that should be, uh, we should come from to try to re-educate the people by bringing them back to the Qur'an and back to the Sunnah. Now once they start to respect the Qur'an, as Allah says, in Kuntum Shahibun Allah, Fatimi Uni Yafibun Allah. Allah says, tell the Prophet to tell the people, if you love Allah, then follow me. And Allah will love you because everybody wants to be loved by Allah. So there is a method. Respect and honor of the Quran, respect and honor of Rasulullah is in obedience. This is where the respect is. Obedience. As for kissing the Quran and disobeying what Allah says in the Quran, this is not obedience. This is not respect. This is disobedience. This is disrespect. You kiss the Qur'an and you go against what Allah tells you to do in the Qur'an. This is disrespect of the Qur'an. This is what the people have to be educated about. If they can come to that understanding, start again to read the Qur'an and back to the Sunnah, then, inshallah, 
we can stop these kind of practices. But it won't stop overnight. And most people who have tried to go down there, you know, where they're doing it and try to say, people don't do this, this is shit. I mean, they've lost their lives, you know, I mean, they've been battered and, you know, these type of things. Uh, we do need some people to go and do this from time to time. But the way to make a change, because this thing happened over a period of time, it didn't happen overnight. The way to change this is to do it, you know, building and re-establishing a new foundation based on the Qur'an and the Sunnah. We educate the people to this new foundation, then we can make change in society. Inshallah. Go ahead, brother. <laughs> Uh, no, you would like to know the recommended procedure, way of performing our prayer. The same. Now, I was able to watch your video film, I mean, video recording. There is the one we say, the intention, you don't need to say with your mouth. You just intend and say Allah Akbar. And again, you say Allah Akbar comes to that. How the prophet perform the daily prayer? So it could there be a session on this uh, you know, this time? Yes, uh, this is, you know, in, this is a part of the program. But to tell you the truth, I mean, there are some other things we're going to go through, something of tafsir and something of uh, hadith and sunnah, and then we're going to go to the is Tahara and Salah. So this is what you know I intended to do. But of course, I mean, to be realistic, it is some way along the line, you know. So if uh, you have specific questions on specific things like the niya, position of the hands, right? I can answer that as a specific question, you know, after, right? So if there are specific points like that, we can touch them, but. We will go through the Salah as a whole, including Tahara, because there's many things concerning Tahara. People doing all kinds of things, you know, which have nothing to do with the Qur'an and Sunnah. But cultural practices from, you know, various uh, traditions, etc. So there's a whole set of things that need to be clarified. We need to go back and see what really the Prophet teach concerning Tahara and Salah. So we try to do that as a whole. But, you know, as I said, uh, if we finish the questions concerning the session today, then we can touch on these two points, for example, that you asked about. The intention and position of the hand in Salah. Okay. The hand is Salah, and the prayer is Yeah, this is what I said. To try to do the whole thing, you know, then we would be doing a session on Salah. Well, okay, okay. What we can do then, as we can say that, uh, I mean, this is basically the last session on Tawheed. So the next uh, session will be going on to the Qur'an and Tafsir of the Qur'an. So if it is the consensus of the people here that they would like to skip the Tafsir and uh, Hadith, Sunnah, and go directly to Salah, which means doing Tahara, and so on. If this is the consensus, then we can do it. I mean, uh, I'm not, you know, following a rigid pattern. So, those who are in favor of skipping tafsir and hadith uh, for the present and going directly to Salah in our next session, uh, please raise your hand. Will you be getting next to the uh, uh, well, yeah, it's possible, and you know, if we want to put the Salah in, in the middle, you know, we can do the Salah and then continue on with the pattern that I was originally, you know, following. But as I said, it's not rigid. If you prefer to go directly to Salah after this session, which completes our heat, then we can do so. And then come back to Tafsir and Hadith afterwards. So those in favor of uh, introduce or beginning uh, Salah in the next session, please Raise your hands. Don't be shy. Put your hand up. You know. 
Come on, come on. I, no, I, I mean, I'm trying to follow step by step, but the thing is, I mean, I know, I mean, you all are seeing the events taking place around us, and you might think that we might not get farther than a couple more sessions and people will be backing up and leaving, you know, something you want to do is a lot, you know, because this is more practical. Huh? Will what? No, I, no, we can understand this. It's no problem. You know, I mean, we'll go back, you see, because even the things can be very tough here. We'll touch on them from time to time, you know, as we're going through Salah. But um, it's no problem. We can probably cover the Salah in uh, Tahara and Salah in, say, two sessions. We can finish it off and then go back to Tafsir and carry on. <laughs> Because, I mean, I can understand, the, you know, your feeling in that Salah is a very practical thing because you're doing it right now five times a day in Sahara. And it would be good to have that <laughs> cleared up, right? So if it is the consensus, you know, it is quite okay. You know, so please, uh, raise your hand, those who are in favor of, you know, going to Salah in the next session. Okay, I think this is the majority. The majority. See, this is what happens, right? I mean, you shouldn't be so shy, you know, about... <laughs> you know, expressing your opinion, because in the beginning when I first asked, I thought it was one brother, he held his hand. And the second time I asked, he raised his hand, a couple others were, you know, after. <laughs> 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 We ourselves will try to find out and ask people, read. Uh, these five pillars are actually, we should be clear. You have to... Okay, Mishwam, no problem. Now, in the Jabiyat court, I have heard that non-Muslim is the court of Ramsey. Hmm? And if there is no witness, they are to from the Holy Quran. When you see this, again, this is hearsay. You have heard. You know, if you saw it, then you could talk about an, a fact. Well, this is hearsay. And from Islamic practice, it is not. This is not, this is not a part of Islamic practice, to swear on the Qur'an. To swear by Allah, yes. I mean, some people may say, well, you know, because Qur'an is the word of Allah, swearing by the word of Allah is equivalent to swearing by Allah. You know, and it is true in that uh, general sense. But the idea, the practice of swearing on the Qur'an or by the Qur'an, this was not done by the Prophet Sallam nor by his companions. You know, so it is, it would say it is not really a part and parcel of Islamic practice. And particularly, of course, for a non-Muslim to do so, it would be meaningless. No, we don't know what happened. You said you heard. No, I have a friend there. He's a brother. Uh-huh. And also from your lecture, I was able to speak something. I think it could be an answer for this, I don't know. You said, who is it? Any religion, but the belief is the same. They believe in one God, and none of us. It's a God. So, but the practice is different. So, in that case, they can, they ought to believe in one God. So, they can do it. But, uh, you know, uh, Islamically speaking, I do not believe that this is Islamically acceptable. And I would check myself to see whether in fact it is a fact. You know, I mean, it just sounds so far out. I mean, I know there are things that happen here which are not necessarily Islamic, according to Islamic teachings. But the court system, generally speaking, is quite firmly based in the uh, Islamic traditions, hadith and so on and so on, you know, the, the cutting off the head and the hand and the, you know, it's, it, it's, it's quite close to the, that's why I, I find it to be very strange. I would check it a little more thoroughly before. But even if it is so, even if it is so, we can say, Islamically speaking, it is not from Islamic <coughs> tradition. There is no support from it in the Sunnah. Or the Prophet There's no support from it. Or from the practices. 
He they dealt with non-Muslims and I don't recall reading anything where they were having the non-Muslims swearing by Allah or by Allah. No, it's prohibited. It is prohibited for us to do so. And since it's prohibited for us to make these pictures, it's prohibited for us to keep them. You know? This is a general principle in Islam. I mean, if you prohibit the means to a thing, you must be prohibiting that thing. A painting, yeah, a photograph. Yeah. This is slightly different now. There's of course a difference of opinion concerning photographs. Now, some there's a body of scholars who hold that the photograph is the modern version of painting. It's modern painting. You know, it's like you know, the computer. You use the buttons now, and you can do these things. This is the modern version. So. If the end result is the same, that you have an image of a human being or an animal, the means doesn't change the law concerning the end result. You understand the principle? So those people who analyze the situation according to that, they hold that photographs are prohibited. Haram. Taking keeping haram. Some scholars also hold that the photograph is not the same as the painting and the carving. Because the painting and the carving is the direct action of human hands in trying to create an image which is like something which Allah has created. Whereas in the case of the photograph, like an image in a mirror, you are capturing the light of something which actually exists. It's not something you are creating, but it is like you catch it, catching it in the mirror and holding that image. Okay? So they argue that no, it is not the same. However, even those who say that it is not the same, they also say that for you to hang it on your walls, it's one thing for you to keep it in the album, personal, whatever. Once you start to hang it on the wall, then now you are entering into the area of what they call ta'awil, or, you know, um, honoring and elevating. You know, you have a picture of, this is my father, this is my grandfather, this is my... It becomes, you see, you are now coming towards those same feelings which are involved in the worship. The image. The worship of the image. So even those who say the photograph is not the same, they will, they do not allow the holding up of these photographs, placing of them, blowing them up, putting them, you know, out for people to see and to honor and to, you know, hold it on, and reverence. They're, they're, they're saying no. That is bringing it into whether the photograph is the same or not. The way in which people are treating it now makes it uh, haram. So they will disallow the, the hanging of these images. Okay. Mm. So I'm ask a question which is related to the previous session. He told us that the uh, I mean, uh, so for the Sahaba not to stand up or get onto the, I mean, uh, the case. In this case, I suppose if you are respecting our parents, you now while we are sitting in our house, when they come to our persons, normally we try and uh, respect them. But we don't have intention of respecting or doing something to our or something like that. We are just respecting our parents. Can you do that? No, but see, one, if you stand up to greet them, you stand to hug them, to kiss them, whatever. This is one thing. Because you are sitting down, so then it's difficult to greet and hug whilst you're sitting, two people sitting. No. So you stand up to greet them and to hug them. 
not standing up in respect for them, right? Because respect is different, because once you are saying you are standing in respect, then it becomes prohibited. The Prophet ﷺ forbade his companions for standing in respect to him. Now, if it is forbidden for us to stand in respect to Prophet Muhammad isn't he greater than our parents? Isn't he? So if we're going to stand in respect to Prophet Muhammad and he forbade it. So therefore, it is not allowed to stand in respect for our parents. And once you say we're standing in respect, as I pointed out the last time, the Malaysians will tell you that it is in our culture for us when we greet our parents that we kiss their knees. We bow and we kiss their knees. This is our respect for them. We don't mean to worship them. This is only kissing, you know, in respect. Then the Buddhist people from Buddhist background, they will come and say, well, in our culture, you know, we show respect for parents by putting our head on their feet. We prostrate on their feet. But this, we're not worshipping them, this is only respect to parents. But these amals are different from the Niyah, and of course amals are different from so now suppose they are standing for Allah and they are standing for parents, completely different actions are different than Niyah. The intention is different. Actually, I understand. I understand that the intention is different. Yeah. But you see, for example, um, if a person commits zina, for a different intention. You know, his intention is not to disobey Allah, but he, has, he makes his intention to worship Allah. Will that make committing zina okay? You see, I mean, truly, Prophet ﷺ said, these are judged by their intentions. But, what it means is that, if you do something halal, for the purpose of worshipping God, then you will be rewarded for that intention. But if you do something haram,